Uh, this one? So you here you got to use that equation. Yeah. It's just that instead of solving for wavelength, you're using energy. And then this one, you're using the equation E equals. So you got energy. You, you got, you're trying to find the energy. You know the frequency. So you just multiply Planck's constants times frequency. So like that's one of the reasons why we write like, you got frequency. You want to find E. There's only one equation that matches that. It's that one. You lost forty six to zero. I mean, we did lose. I'm sorry for that. That hurts. What's a big deal? No, there are certain positions in football that it's kind of hard, especially when like, you know, um, you need someone to know the plays. Yeah. <laughs> that's, I, I that's saw our freshman team. He had to go. He's, he's not bad. He was just like, he's kind of scared to this first time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, huh? I'll never forget. I was up. I was there got two times. When I was in high school, our soccer team was like in regionals, and one of the guys got sick, and so they moved me up as a sophomore. And I'll never forget, I let a guy get behind me and they almost scored a goal. The goalie pulled the goalie pulled me aside, the senior and said, if you mess up again, I'm going to, and then I can't repeat any of the words you've been using. Fifteen years old, and after that I was so afraid to screw up, but I didn't let a guy get behind me again. <laughs> Grab his other college. You do that again. I'm going to bleep, 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 bleep to you. Like, all right. Can you hear me now?
I am, but we haven't started yet. For those of you at home, we're just waiting for um, the pledge to start. Pledge my allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yeah, we're good. So if you haven't uploaded your homework, upload your homework. We're gonna go through that first. Um, the agenda for today, let me just make sure, uh, okay, I gotta do this here. All right, so you guys can see, I claim the host. Gotta admit people, share the screen. So let's, and I will um, update this in Canvas, but uh, we didn't get as far as we thought first hour. So everything is gonna be pushed back today, which isn't the end of the world because um, there are a lot of people gone on Tuesday. So tonight, today is Thursday, there is no homework. However, if you want to work ahead, which I um, suggest um, Friday night, your homework is gonna be quantum worksheet number one. You, by the end of today, you'll know most of how to do quantum worksheet number one. Not all of it, but most of it. So um, you could, and then homework for Tuesday night will be the practice test. And then Wednesday, we'll take the test. Yep. Um, you go to your AP test. So if you have an AP test on Tuesday, you go to whoever that AP test is. So um, normally what they do is they give you an hour after the test is done to go get some food and combobulate yourself. 
Okay. Um, now I'm teaching chemistry in the morning. I don't have afternoon classes. So now I'm speaking as a teacher. It's in your best interest to go to your fifth and seventh hour class when you're done with your AP test, um, because they will be covering material. They're not just going to be doing nothing. And then you end up getting a day behind. So, you know, I always recommend that when you're done with your AP test, eat your lunch, go use the bathroom, and then go to your classes. You know, now I feel like an old man, but back in my day, we took AP tests on Saturday morning. Um, well, because, you know, if there's one student missing, do you have the other 28 just do nothing? Well, if everyone's gone, that's a different scenario, but a lot of times it's like a quarter of the class. So, you know, um, so it won't affect chemistry at all, but I'm just saying you should check in with your fifth and seventh hour teachers. That's part of growing up. Just don't assume, oh, they're doing nothing. No, they're gonna be doing something. So check in with them. Um, and just like anything, you know, talk to your teachers, you know, if you need an extension, you know, talk to you, talk to them ahead of time. But Anyhow, we're just pushing everything back a day. So Friday night, the homework is quantum worksheet number one. Tuesday night, the homework will be the practice test. Wednesday, we will take the test, okay? Um, and you will know how to do this whole worksheet except for two problems tonight. So if you wanna work ahead, Amanda, you can. There will just only be two problems you won't know how to do. So don't wait till the last minute, Evan. Don't wait till Monday night at 11 p.m. going, oh crap, I got chem homework. Now I wasted, now I wasted Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and now it's late at night on Monday. I can't email Mr. Strauss for help because he's already asleep. So, and you'll learn this in college. You can't wait to the night before to do your homework or your labs. Well, here's the thing is, there's nobody to access for help. So that's why you don't want to wait in college till the last minute. Um, so, uh, all right. So let's go through that worksheet. Everybody's uploaded their homework. Otherwise, if you haven't, I'll give you an alternative assignment to do. So, and for the ones I've looked online, so the ones I've already graded, they look pretty good. Oh, that, yeah, here we go, there we go. Um, so I'm gonna go a little bit quick through these earlier problems and I'll slow down on the other ones. Just want to make sure we're all good at home. Everybody at home can hear me. You want to give me a thumbs up? Make sure that we're all good to go before I start explaining. All right. So um, all your equations that we've learned so far are up here. Okay. You don't have to memorize your equations. They're always there for you. We've got Planck's constant in two forms, one that's in kilojoules per mole, one that's in joules per one, okay? So you can always go back and look at these equations as we do the problems. So for number one, we're trying to find the energy change. So we do the final minus the initial. So we're going from four to five. So negative 
minus 81.9, and that gives us a positive 29.7 kilojoules per mole. For two, so here we're going from fourth to fifth. Here we're going from fourth to second. So this is going to be the final is the second, negative 327.5 minus a negative. Eighty one point nine. That gives me negative two forty five point six. So I picked one problem where the answer was positive and one where the answer was negative. So the reason why I did that is I just want to, you know, reinforce this idea. If you're positive, Karen, you are gaining. OK, so if you're positive twenty dollars. You gain twenty dollars, right? If you're negative $20, you lost it, okay? So negative values means you're losing the energy, positive values mean you're gaining the energy, all right? Number three is the same. The only difference is we're going from infinity from the first. So at infinity, the value is zero kilojoules per mole. The first is negative 1310. So the answer is that. So in other words, we're taking an electron from the first and taking that electron and moving it all the way to infinity. So it's gonna take us that much energy to completely remove the electron. Any questions on one, two, or three? I know I went through those fast, but I, again, looking at the homework online, it looked like you guys understood one, two, and three. You got a question, Audrey? You sure? Yeah. Okay. Four, five, six, and seven are the same problem. All I did was change the energy levels. And I also broke it up into steps for you. Okay, that's called scaffolding. So it's kind of like, you know, when your parents helping you ride a bike, first they hold on to the seat, then they kind of let go a little bit, and then they just step back and watch you do it. So I broke it up into parts A, B, and C. The next worksheet, Keegan, I don't do that. Okay, you just have to look at the problem and realize you got a couple steps to do. So final minus initial. From the third to the second, so that is going to be negative 327 minus a negative 145. So my answer is negative 182. For B, we're going to use that equation e equals hc over lambda. So just to review the algebra with you. Multiply both sides by lambda. Then divide by energy. Okay, so that's the correct way to do the algebra to get wavelength by itself. We know the energy from part A is 182. We know the speed of light. And then the wavelength. We don't know. And what Planck's constant will we use? So we got two options. Because our energy is in kilojoules per mole, we use this one, the 
So again, I'm trying to be very explicit so that you see how this problem is done. Once you've got all your information written down, and that's worth one point, once you do your algebra, that's worth one point, then and only then do you start plugging numbers in. Now, why did my energy become positive? Um, the equation is E, and this is delta E. So you have to take the absolute value. You can't have a negative number for energy in this equation. Otherwise, you end up with a negative wavelength, and you can't have that. Okay? So you can't have your energy be negative. That's why you've got this equation up at top here where it says take the absolute value to get E. And if I put that into my calculator, I get 6.56 times 10 to the negative seven meters. We don't have a book. So we're just using Appendix J. So Appendix J says, what type of light is this gonna be? So then we go to our Appendix J. The visible spectrum is 10 to the negative seven. 686 puts us over there at red. So when an electron falls from the third to the second, it's going to make red light. Oh, it's 656. It's my fault. 656. So then We're supposed to put our answers into this table here. So what type of light? Red. What was the wavelength? 656. What was the energy? 182. So if you didn't fill that table in, please make sure you fill it in with the correct numbers. So do you have any questions at home? Any zoomies? Great. Any questions in the classroom about number four? How does it look, Amanda? Good. Egan, you should follow along with your own work. So like I said, five, six, and seven are identical, except I changed the energy levels. So delta E is gonna be negative 327 minus a negative Eighty one point nine. When I get negative two forty six. Calculating the wavelength minus the negative is a positive. So for B. Forty six. That gives me a wavelength of four point eight six times ten to the negative seventh.
Then Jader, we go back and look at our sheet. 486. Four eighty six is right about there, green. All right. Um, so that's green. 486, the energy was 246. So again, make sure you fill out that table. There's a point to that table. Number six, final is now the, we're starting at the fifth, which is negative 52.2. That gives me negative 275 kilojoules per mole. Plug in our numbers. Divided by 275. That will get me 4.34 times 10 to the negative seventh. So again, we're just doing the same thing, same equation. The color of light will be blue. In fact, I'm going to fill this in first. So blue, 434, and the energy was Doki, and then the last one, six to the second. It's 45, no, 50, no, 36.3. Negative 291. So the kilojoules cancels with kilojoules, seconds cancels with seconds. No, the kilojoules don't cancel. Yeah, it does, just kidding. So the only unit we're left with is meters. The moles cancels with moles. So we should always double check to make sure the units cancel correctly, okay? So this is gonna be 410. And the energy was 291. So there is a purpose. There's a uh, there's a method to my madness. There's a reason why I'm organizing this data for you, and it'll become clear when we take notes today about um, the Bohr model. Okay. So any questions on? Seth? Any questions out at home, four through seven?
I guarantee you there'll be a problem like that on the test, right? So you know how to do at least one problem on the test so far. All right, Avery, number eight. I've got a wavelength of 0 0.50 nanometers. Mm -hmm. You might as well just go right away and convert it to meters. Okay. Again, that's the sort of stuff you can't look up. Okay, you just need to know that wavelength has to be in meters, mass has to be in kilograms. What am I trying to find? Energy. Well, which equation has wavelength and energy in it? That is the only equation that's got energy and wavelength in it. Okay. And again, that's why I have you write down all the information. It helps you pick the correct equation. It's not because I'm some power freak. You don't have to do any algebra because we're solving for E. It asks for per mole. So because it's per mole, I use that Planck's constant divide by my wavelength. And seconds cancel with seconds, meters cancel with meters. My units left are kilojoules per mole. And my answer is 2.4 times 10 to the fifth kilojoules per mole. Okay, so it's the same equation as four through seven. It's just we're solving for something different. Number nine, you've got a frequency. I'm trying to find energy. There is only one equation that has E and F in it. So when we go to the top of the page there, Keegan, that's the only equation, Keith, that's got energy and frequency in it. So that must be the correct equation to use that. says one mole of photons. So if it's one mole, use this as my frequency. The seconds cancels with the inverse seconds and the units I'm left with is kilojoules per mole, which is good because that's what we measure energy in. And there's my answer. 9.78 times 10 to the negative fourth kilojoules per mole. Oh, there's no table on your worksheet? That's weird. You sure you're looking at the right worksheet, Celia? I was looking on the wrong page, but I found it now. Okay, okay. So, but that's actually a great segue for me. So why did I put this table on here? If you look at the wavelength, it's getting smaller, right? What's happening to the energy? The energy is getting bigger. So there is a inverse relationship. As the wavelength gets smaller, the energy gets bigger, okay? So purple light has more energy than red light, okay? Is 
You have these eight forms memorized already. As one of the objectives. So I don't know how well you paid attention in biology, but plants do photosynthesis, right? What do they need for photosynthesis? They need light, right? Um, they will use blue light. Chlorophyll absorbs blue light. Why blue? Blue's got more energy. Um, I'm not sure why it hasn't evolved to use purple because purple light has more energy, but chlorophyll absorbs blue light. There are other pigments that absorb like red and orange and yellow light. Those are the pigments we see in the fall, right? When chlorophyll goes away, then those other pigments are absorbing the other colors of light. Why doesn't, um, why don't plants absorb gamma X rays or UV? They've got more energy. What happens if I give you gamma and x-rays? And... Yeah, it goes right through you. It's too much energy. It would kill the plant. Plus, the fact is the atmosphere filters most of that out. So you're not getting a whole lot of gamma rays. You're getting a little bit. Okay, if you go outside, Jader, you get a little bit of gamma, a little bit of x-ray from the sun, but not a lot, okay? So that kind of answers question number 10. If gamma rays have more energy, why don't we use them to heat up our food? What blocks gamma? Lead. So your microwave, well, first of all, we wouldn't call it a microwave, we call it a gamma wave. Your gamma wave would have to be built out of lead. Otherwise, every time you turn the machine on, you'd ex be exposing yourself to deadly gamma radiation. That would be bad. So we don't use gamma, we don't use x-rays. We do use ultraviolet for tanning beds. Okay, we slowly cook you on a tanning bed. Roast you on one side, flip, roast you on the other side, baste. Visible light's got the next amount of energy. Plants use that for photosynthesis. We use microwaves because they are much less dangerous. And what blocks microwaves? Metal. So the microwaves cannot get out of the, can't get out of the machine. And what else, what else happens? What happens if you try to open the door? What happens to your microwave? It turns off, right? So there's a safety factor built in there anyhow, okay? So I do feel that part of my job is to like dispel myths because people, buy into some of these weird conspiracy myth stuff. So um, you guys still have to read Frankenstein for, AP, for uh, English. Did you read it? So Megan read Frankenstein. Um, so Frankenstein builds a monster. He's all excited about you know, like creating life. He makes this great discovery. And as soon as he makes this great discovery, then he's afraid of it, okay? That's kind of what we do. And it's a metaphor really for our relationship with science. So if you look at some of the great discoveries, we love it and then we're afraid of it. So if you go back to the 1800s, the bike, you know what the bike was supposed to do to you? Make you sterile. Yep, because you're sitting on the bike, it's gonna make you sterile. Then when the radio was invented, what was the radio gonna make you, what was the radio gonna do to you? Make you sterile. Oh, and make you go blind and give you cancer. That never happened. Then the TV. What, what, do, you, what do people say if you stare at the TV too long? It's gonna make you blind, make you sterile, give you cancer. I don't know what's up with our country that we're like always afraid of being made sterile. I don't know. Um, then came the microwave. What's the microwave supposed to do to you? Give you cancer, 
make you sterile, make you go blind. No. And now the, the most current one is the cell phone, right? What's the cell phone supposed to do to you? Give you cancer, make you blind, make you sterile. No. What does the cell phone use? Radio waves. They're the least energetic waves, okay? So um, there isn't one study showing problems with um, cell phone usage as far as sterility, cancer, or blindness. Um, you can get in an accident if you're texting, that can kill you. Um, you can fall off a cliff while taking a selfie. That happens. Seriously, there's about, they estimate there's about 400 deaths a year due to selfies because they go beyond the barrier and then they accidentally fall off the cliff while they're taking their selfie. Oh well. Um, but you know, just an FYI, we don't know the effect of cell phone usage over a lifetime because cell phones have only been around for 20 years. So is there a problem with using a cell phone from age 10 all the way to age 90? Probably not, but we can't definitively say yes or no because no one has had a cell phone for 70 years. But we do know that we've had televisions for over 100 years and no one's gone blind yet or gotten sterile from a TV or a microwave. So I think we're safe. All right, um, any other questions on the homework? Otherwise, I'm gonna show you a couple little videos um, about this table, about why it's kind of important. Do you have any questions, Emma? No. Morgan, you good? Yeah, I'm good. All right. Remember, you know, I've got office hours Monday afternoon. You know, um, plus if you ever have questions at night or during the day, you know, email me. More than happy to help you. All right. I'm going to uh, show you. Uh, short little uh, video clip. And so I'm going to log off the iPad and log on to my computer here. First, I'm not going to remember to unmute myself. All right. So if you go to FET simulations, there's all these cool simulations you can run. I highly recommend it. You can go figure out how um, a microwave oven works. You can learn about the photoelectric effect. You can learn about how a TV station produces radio waves. Yeah, TV stations produce radio waves. So do radio stations. They're just different frequencies. Um, I want to show you this simulation. So just a quick recap of the models. So the first model was the billiard ball, solid sphere. Then plum pudding. Then Rutherford discovered the nucleus and the electron went around it. Okay. So the model that you probably learned in middle school was that you had this nucleus and the electron went around the nucleus and you had these different orbits. Now the orbits, Morgan, are quantized, meaning the electron can only orbit at those distances. And how do I get an electron to go from one orbit to the next? How do I get it to jump? And that's not a rhetorical question, Sophie. How do I get my electron, Sophie, to go from, let's say, the first level out to the fourth? 
you got to add energy. And you can add energy in the form of light or heat. Um, I'm going to add light. And this is what my little light source is going to do. I'm going to slow it down. So red is red light. Green is green light. Purple is purple light. This guy right here is ultraviolet. Okay. So it absorbed the ultraviolet light and it jumped all the way out to the sixth energy level. Now, when it falls, it does not have to fall all the way to the first. It could fall to the second, it could fall to the third. We'll see what it does. Where'd it go? Uh, different. Different colors of light have different energy and you gotta have the exact amount of energy to jump. Okay, it fell all the way down to the first. And when it falls to the first, let's see what it gave off. We should be able to see it right there. See that photon of light? It's going at a different direction. That was given off by the electron. So it gave off ultraviolet light. Now it jumped to the third. When it went from the third to the second, it gave off green light. So if we speed this up, what you see is the electron is continually jumping and falling and giving off light. So it jumps, falls, jumps, falls. That's the de Broglie and that's what you learned in middle school, okay? And the other little video I wanna show you here is mainly for the benefit of the people at home because you guys didn't have the spectroscopes. Okay, and constantly, so you never have to slow down at work. Stay on top of emails, documents, and image is a, a red line. This is one of our funnest demonstrations to show atomic spectra. I'm going to show a spectrum of a uh, an, an incandescent bulb, which is continuous. And then I'm going to show the spectra of four different elements, mercury, nitrogen, neon, and especially hydrogen. Hydrogen will be important in labs and in many other applications. So to show a spectrum, what we use is, is called a diffraction grating. This looks like a piece of clear plastic, but it's not. It is uh, actually a piece of clear plastic on which an image has been inscribed with dark line, clear line, dark line, clear line with about 10 to 13,000 lines per inch. So it's called a grating, um, just like a street grate has lines through it. And this allows you to resolve the spectrum of, um, of a source of light in the same way that a prism will resolve a spectrum. So what we're going to do is to place this uh, diffraction grating in front of a camera and show you the view of this continuous um, source with a diffraction grating in place. And what you'll see uh, in the image is, is the, uh, the image of the, of the incandescent bulb itself. And then to the right and to the left, you'll see uh, a rainbow spectrum that shows which, what wavelengths are present. So this is what we call continuous spectrum because every single type of light is present, okay? So um, who, who, uh, who paints? Anybody takes an art class with Miss, uh, you do Sotera? You do Lola? So what color do you get Lola if you mix all your paints together? Brown. So if you mix all of your colors together, you get brown. That's not with light. 
If you mix all the colors of light together, it appears white, okay? So now I'm just kind of skip forward here. He's going to now, boop, 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 boop. He's got a tube full of metallic mercury in the gaseous form. It's according to the spectrum of the, of the element that we're using, in this case, mercury. So I'm going to locate this, this proper spot, turn off the continuous spectrum. So this is a mercury spectrum. So this is a kind of a bluish light. Now, what if we separate this one out? What do we get? Uh, without the diffraction grading. And we get it in focus here. It's a bluish colored uh, spectrum. There are um, mercury vapor lights that are used as um, street lights. So this may look similar to this bluish tint to the mercury vapor. Now let's try it with the diffraction grading in place. And what you see in this case. So in other words, this blue light here is actually a mixture of a darker blue, a green and a lighter green. So this blue is a mixture of three wavelengths of light, three distinct, or we would say bright lines. How about neon? So that looks orangish, right? It's actually a mixture of red, green, blue, Here is, no, that was nitrogen. This is neon, sorry. This is neon. There's a beautiful orange look to it. And when the diffraction grading is in place, see a large number of red and orange lines. So this color here is actually the mixture of green, yellow, orange, and red. This is exactly, um, what's used for neon lights, reddish cast to it. And then the last one is hydrogen. Now, why is hydrogen important? Because it's a simple element to, to study. It looks kind of purplish. If we separate out the colors, this is what we see. We get, uh, it's kind of little, maybe on this, there it's a little bit better or not. You can't see the green line very well. Or the, we got the red line. That's kind of a, actually a teal, a blue. And there should be a purple line right here, but it doesn't really show up very well. But red, teal, blue, and then I don't see the purple. <clears throat> so that's um, what's called uh, bright line emission spectrum, okay? So we're gonna switch back over to um, the iPad. And so just remember this red, teal, blue, maybe there's the purple, I don't know.
Mr. Charles, if you're talking, we can't hear you. Sorry about that. Oh, okay. So now I, can. I was just going to say that um, here are the colors of this hydrogen spectrum. They're caused by six to the second, fifth to the second, the electron falling the fourth and the third. Okay. So the Bohr model explains this. So now let's. Bohr is the one you learned in middle school. So it, it does a good job of explaining things, but it's not perfect, okay? So just to kind of show you, that's how those colors of lights are made. So when you fall from the sixth to the second, you get purple light. Fifth to the second, you get blue. Fourth to the second, you get green. And fifth, or sorry, third to the second, you get red. You know what happens if you fall all the way down to the first? You get an ultraviolet light. That's the reason why I didn't have you calculate it falling to the first level, because it kind of means nothing to you. You know, what color is ultraviolet light? No color, because you can't see it. So if things fall to the second level, you get visible light. If it falls to the first, you get ultraviolet, okay? And then the other thing I wanna make sure that you include in your notes is as wavelength gets smaller, energy gets bigger. So if wavelength gets smaller, energy gets bigger. You feeling okay, Morgan? I mean, Maria, sorry. Yeah, I'm doing Morgan. good. Good. <laughs> All right, so. If you have colored pencils, or pens, use them. If you don't, it is not the end of the world. Um, so on the next page, it goes over the good stuff about the Bohr model. So the Bohr model does some good things. Okay, it explains how things make light. But just like the other models, there are problems with it. It doesn't explain why the electrons can only orbit at certain distances. That doesn't make sense. It doesn't explain why aren't the electrons attracted to the protons? Why don't they just zoom into one another and attract? But it did explain why these different colors of light were produced. By the way, the red line was the skinniest, the green was fatter, blue is even fatter, and the purple was the fattest. Yep. Now, like I said, if you got colors, great. If you don't have colors, you don't need the colors. Now, maybe you were able to see this with your eyes, maybe you weren't, but the red line was actually a single red line, but the green line was actually two separate lines. And again, maybe your eye was able to see that, maybe not. But the green line was actually two lines, a skinny one and a little bit fatter one. And the blue line was actually three lines, small, medium, and large one. And the purple line was actually four different lines. Again, their thickness is increased.
Bohr couldn't explain this. And when you discover something in science, Audrey, you get to name it, sort of. Um, Thompson discovered the electron he wanted to call it the corpuscle. Yeah, JJ Thompson discovered the electron. He wanted to call it the corpuscle. He was overruled by the scientific community and said, no, 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 that's a dumb name. But what science did, well, I mean, think about the names of the quarks, top, bottom, strange, charm. Uh, what are the other ones? Up, down, up, down, top, bottom, strange, and charm. One guy wanted what? Name them truth and beauty. But anyhow, they named the first line in the sequence, the sharp line. So the first line in the sequence, they called sharp. The second line in the sequence, they called principle. The third line in the sequence, they called diffuse. And the fourth line in the sequence, they called fine. So this is where we get the letters S, P, D, and F from. They just came up with some names so that we could all talk about the same thing. So if I said, oh, the fine line, you would know what line I was talking about. If I said the green sharp line, you would know which line I was talking about. By the way, do you notice a pattern here? One, two, three, four lines. D stands for diffuse. And then when they hit it with a magnetic field, nothing happened to the red sharp line. Nothing happened to the green sharp line. But the green principal line split into three. Nothing happened to the sharp line. But the blue principal line split into three. And the blue diffuse line split into five. So you're seeing a pattern develop already. One, one, three, one, three, five. I was going to say, you guess what's going to happen to the purple line. So the S line, nothing happened. The principal line split into three. Oops, I wrote that wrong. There you go. And how many lines do you think the F split into? Seven. So again, they have no idea what was going on. Okay, they don't know why this was happening. And that's why the Bohr model failed. Okay, the Bohr model couldn't explain what was going on. The correct model of the atom is the last one, the Schrodinger, that's the model we're gonna teach you, but it's hard to wrap your mind around. So it's gonna take us about two or three days to get through the last model, okay? Now, um, de Broglie was a French scientist and what he like all these guys, they're working together. And he said, okay, Max Planck said that light could act like a particle. Max Planck said, okay, light, which is a wave, can be a, like a particle. Well, if that's true, why can't the opposite be true? Why can't particles be waves? If waves like light can be particles, why can't the opposite true? Particles like electrons be waves. 
And so there is a experiment that they proposed is that you take an electron gun and you shoot electrons at a wall. But the wall's got a little opening in it. And then on the other side, you put a target. So if the electron is a particle, like a tiny little baseball, So what's going to happen if the electron is a tiny little baseball? What would we predict? I'm going to just use a different color. Where's the electron going to hit? It's going to hit the target right in the middle, right? Can the electron hit up here? No. Could it hit down there? No. But what if the electron was a wave? Wall is my target. What do waves do? They spread out, right? What do you think is going to happen, Maria, when the wave hits the wall? Some of it will bounce back, right? Will the wave be able to go through that little hole? Some of it, right? And then what happens once a wave gets on the other side? It spreads out again. So then where will the wave hit the target? everywhere right so here's an easy way for them to see if an electron is a wave or a particle if it hits only in the middle then the electron is clearly a particle if the electron hits the entire screen then the electron is a wave okay so i am going to um switch back to the um, computer here to show you this experiment um, they're actually going to show you the double slit experiment, but it's the same idea. Okay. So um, I'm just going to switch over here. Unmute. Watch two short videos. Oh, wait, I didn't share my screen, did I? No, I did. Here, what? So double check. Can you give me a thumbs up at home if uh, you can see my screen and some guy with long hair? <laughs> All right. Double slit experiment. He knows a lot about the science of Christmas, 
in learning about the first few discoveries that led to the development of quantum mechanics, we discussed wave particle duality. So we understand that both light and matter behave as both particles and waves. But we glossed over some of the technical details. So let's zoom in for a moment. In 1801, Thomas Young performed experiments where light was passed through a plane with two slits in it, striking a screen beyond. The diffraction and interference patterns that resulted clearly supported the wave model of light with the brighter bands representing constructive interference and the darker bands representing destructive interference with the width of the bands being a function of the frequency of the light. Later in the century, Maxwell showed that light is the wave of oscillating electric and magnetic fields. So it seemed as though the case was closed on the declaration of light as waves. But as we said, in 1905, Einstein solved the problem of the photoelectric effect by assigning particle nature to light. Thus, wave particle duality was born. Later, de Broglie proposed that particles must therefore also display wave-like behavior. And this was shown to be true in an experiment, just like Young's more than 100 years prior. This modern version is what we are typically referring to when we talk about the double slit experiment. From this, it was shown that a beam of electrons exhibits diffraction and interference patterns, just like light does. This demonstrates the wave-like properties of electrons and by extension, matter in general. Later, low intensity experiments showed that even an individual electron when passing through biprisms or slits will interfere with itself, making the wave-like nature of the electron undeniable. So it was shown that electrons act as both particles and waves, but not just electrons, neutrons were also shown to exhibit diffraction patterns. It must be understood that since all particles are also waves, literally any object could hypothetically exhibit a diffraction pattern, so long as the object passes through an aperture roughly the size of the object's wavelength. But remember that massive objects have incredibly tiny wavelengths. So for something like a human being to diffract, they would have to pass through an aperture around 10 to the negative 36 meters wide, which is a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a meter. So this will be pretty tough, no matter how much you diet. In this way, we begin to see how Newtonian mechanics is not the fundamental descriptor of motion, but rather that it emerges from quantum mechanics as objects become large enough that their wavelengths are negligible. So don't worry, everything you learn in classical physics will still work just fine for any object you can see with your eyes. But along with these waves of matter- came Okay, this is where I'm gonna stop it. Um, and then I wanna show you one other one. This guy. You'd expect that if I roll a few of these balls down the lane, they'll either be stopped by the barrier or pass through one or the other slit and hit the screen at the back. And in fact, that's just what happens. Those balls that make it through always hit the screen directly behind either the left slit or the right slit. The double slit experiment was much like this, except instead of bowling balls, you use electrons, which are billions of times smaller. So now he's gonna throw electrons instead of bowling balls and we'll see what happens. You can picture them like this. Let's see what happens if I throw a bunch of these balls. When electrons are hurled at the two slits, something very different happens on the other side. Instead of hitting just two areas, the electrons land all over the detector screen, creating a pattern of stripes, including some right between the two slits, the very place you think would be blocked. So electrons are hitting behind the behind the wall and 
there are some places where it seems like the electrons just don't hit those dark areas. Also, where did most electrons hit? The center, right behind. What happens as you go further out? Further, uh, less electrons, right? Where is a wave the biggest? Like, just think of a water wave at the beach. Where is the, where is the amplitude of the wave the biggest? In the middle. So this would indicate that an electron is a wave. So what's going on? Well, to physicists, even in the 1920s, this pattern can mean only one thing. Waves. Waves do all kinds of interesting things. Yes, they do. All right, so we're gonna stop there and we're gonna go back to the iPad. Now, again, it's really hard to wrap your mind around how a particle can act like a wave, but it can. And a wave can act like a particle. So light waves act like particles. We call those particles photons. Okay, I am unmuted. I'm sharing my screen. Are you sure? Down here, I am muted on my computer. I need to be muted on my computer, but please never hesitate to say Mr. Strauss is muted because nobody likes having to hear me say the same thing twice. Some of you don't like hearing me say anything. You didn't have to agree, Karen. You could have said no, Mr. Strauss. We crave more. All right. So um, we are on page ten, I believe now. Einsteining. So this is, this is the last page. And then, um, although you don't have any homework tonight, you will have some time to start um, on tomorrow night's homework. So if you wanna get a head start on it. But um, can you give me a thumbs up that you can hear me at home? Yes, sir. All right, that's good. So under Newtonian or classical mechanics, matter and energy are separate, okay? Either you are a bowling ball or you're a sound wave, completely separate. It'd be ludicrous to say a sound wave is the bowling ball, right? Or a bowling ball is a sound wave. They're completely separate. But under quantum mechanics, they began to see that light waves could be like bowling balls. And bowling balls like electrons could be like sound waves. In other words, Things aren't separate, but they are different forms of one another. So particles could be waves, waves could be particles, matter and energy aren't separate. And Einstein came up with the equation that relates matter and energy together. How you relate light and um, energy or matter. It's a very good paper. If you wanna go look up the paper, you can go read it. His, uh, his proof is much more complex. I'm not gonna go through the proof, but if you wanna go look up online, you can see his proof of how he derived that equation, okay? So um, we're gonna do an extremely simple um, example of this, okay? So um, let's see, okay, Finley's in the front row, so Finley's gonna be our volunteer. So Finley weighs, approximately 60 kilograms, okay? Mass has to be in kilograms, Lars, okay? Mass has to be in kilograms. We're gonna take Finley's mass and we're gonna throw him into a nuclear reactor and we are gonna destroy every single atom in Finley's body. We will obliterate him 
and turn every single piece of him into pure energy. Okay? So we are going to calculate the energy produced when we throw Finley into a nuclear reactor. So 60 kilograms times the speed of light squared. And so I'm going to put that into the calculator. I get 5.4 times 10 to the 18th joules. Now you're probably saying, how the heck did you get joules? Well, the definition of a joule is one kilogram meter squared over second squared. Okay. So a joule is a kilogram times a meter squared divided by a second squared. That's the definition of a joule. So we get 5.4 times 10 to the 18th joules of energy if we destroy Finley. Um, now, I want to give you a little bit of perspective on how much energy this is. So a watt is one joule used in one second. So wattage is telling me how many joules I'm using per second. So a 100 watt light bulb would use 100 joules in a second. A 75 watt light bulb uses 75 joules in a second. So obviously lower wattage is better, right? Because you're using less energy. And that's why Evan, we've switched over to the energy efficient bulbs. The uh, LEDs, they use like nine watts. That's like nine, that's a huge energy savings versus a hundred, that's crazy. Um, so just to give you some perspective here, and I seem to have written very large. So this, this is the amount of energy from Finland. How long could we run a hundred watt light bulb? It's one of the old incandescents, you know, one of those bright hundred watt light bulbs. How long could we run a hundred watt light bulb on Finley? So I always think of energy as money. So I've got this many dollars, I'm going to spend my money $100 a second. So 100 joules a second. And then I'm going to convert this into years. There are that many seconds in one year. So if I put that in my calculator, I end up with 1.7 times 10 to the ninth years. So in other words, we could run a 100 watt light bulb for almost 2 billion years, just based on the energy found in, in um, Finley's body. So there is a ton of energy in mass, okay? Now, don't worry, Finley. Um, we're not going to throw you into a nuclear reactor anytime soon because it's, uh, it's too difficult. It is much easier if you already start with something unstable. Um, so like uranium, plutonium, those are unstable atoms. You're just way too stable, Finley. So you're not, I mean, we could do it in theory, but it's just a lot easier if you already start with something unstable. So, <laughs> so um, this is as complicated as a problem as we're gonna get. Um, 
it's just really too hard to use a real example like uranium or plutonium. The math gets too hard, and then I lose half of you. So, um, so we'll stick to throwing things like people into nuclear reactors. All right. So um, we're going to stop here. Now, if you want to work, like I said, um, you know enough. You know enough to do everything on quantum worksheet number one except five or six. So if you don't have a lot of homework tonight, Audrey, maybe get a head start on it. Okay, because this is due Tuesday. The whole worksheet is due Tuesday. Tomorrow we'll learn how to do five and six. Okay, um, there just is not enough time today, and I don't want to start it. But um, you could get these other ones done. All right. Um, I know I lectured a lot today, so. The last 10 minutes, uh, you guys can use it however you want to. Okay, if you want to get started on the homework, I'm more than happy to help you. If you need a break, I get it. Um, or if you want to look at your cell phones, you can look at your cell phones. Don't worry, they won't give you cancer or make you blind or make you sterile. Yet. Can we leave? Yes, at home, if you want to log out.